Now what will it be? Death or exile? Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to another installment of the Film Exiles podcast. Tonight, myself and the one, the only, Live Love Lupe will be uh, doing a quick uh, a discussion about some of the many news topics that have been present uh, in the past uh, week or so. Uh, Lupe, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. I'm glad to be here. Uh, how are you doing, Manu? I'm doing good. Gl- I'm doing well. I'm doing well. So, um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna try to um, going forward. We're gonna try to 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 do this pod uh, every once uh, once a week, maybe every other week, uh, where we try to uh, talk about uh, everything that's been uh, in the film uh, in the filmosphere. I guess we could call it that. Uh, that I like it. Yeah, <laughs> you know, uh, any topic that people are interested in, and that you know, I I feel like uh, I think we both feel that. Uh, we at the Exiles have pretty, pretty good um, opinions and top uh, opinions on these topics, and that we should share them with our listeners. Yeah. yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Like, I think putting out a podcast once every week, engaging with uh, our listeners, and you know, keeping them up to date on what's going on, and you know, having them hear our views is very important. So. Yeah. Yeah. So let's, let's get on this journey. So, yeah. So, um, well, for, for, uh, uh, why don't we start with, uh, Disney and, uh, Bob Iger, uh, who, uh, revealed very recently, uh, how George Lucas felt betrayed by their Star Wars plans. Um, so, uh, as the story goes, um, as the story goes, when Disney bought, uh, the, the rights from Star Wars from Lucasfilm, uh, from Lucas, uh, he outlined, Lucas outlined three new movies, uh, and uh, Disney bought these movies, and um, and uh, uh, when Lucas sold them, it was, he was under the impression that um, they would use these films, uh, they would use his treatments on their new trilogy. Uh, but he was very disappointed to find out that that was not the case. Uh, even though, according to Iger, it was made clear in the purchase agreement that they would not be contractually obligated to uh, Lucas. Uh, was believed or was made to believe that they would uh, until uh, there was a meeting with him, uh, uh, Kennedy, J.J. Uh, Abrams, where they broke the news to him. Uh, Lupe, do you have uh, what are your thoughts on this whole situation? Um, I think it's very interesting. Like Star Wars is a beleaguered franchise. Like this is a franchise that has had so many issues with its fans. Um, over the years, it seems like ever since the first um, like original trilogy, they've always had like these epic battles between the creators and the fans. And now it's happening for the second time. Um, and fans are going to look to this um, incident as because now fans are fighting with Disney. Disney's like the big bad, you know. Yeah. And now fans are are this is gonna be like more ammo for for the fans to be like, oh, you know what, Disney's terrible, Disney's destroying, you know, Star Wars, you know, they they're not they, you know, deceived the original creator, blah, 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 blah. But I think um I think it's a little bit more complex than that. There is some truth to that, but at the same time. George Lucas sold his Star Wars. And from what I hear, um, more more stuff that's in the book that Bob Iger wrote, where this revelation comes from, George Lucas actually like talked to no one, no other studios. It wasn't like there was a bidding war for Star Wars or, you know, he was thinking about maybe either selling it to Paramount or, you know, some other studios, Sony or Warner. Disney was the first and Disney was the only. And um, if he wanted creative control, he shouldn't have sold it to them. But at the same time, it just highlights something that a lot of people don't know about Disney. Like Disney comes up as this like really beautiful, you know, nice family friendly land of dreams. 
but they're some of the most business savvy, cold blooded, <laughs> you know, business practitioners in the in, in the game. And let's just call a spade a spade. George Lucas got game. I mean, that's, he made four billion dollars. I don't. I don't know if that's the right word. It's not like as though he I wasn't mean, but, properly. Uh, <laughs> it's not uh, as though he. Yeah, but, but on. But you know, can you remember he gave away a lot of it, didn't he? Uh, I'm not sure about that. Uh, I, I can remember. Um, I wouldn't I might, be surprised. I, to, I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. But um, I might need to look. I might need to look that up. He he did give away a lot of it, but even if he didn't. George Lucas was never hurting for cash. No, like the, uh, the dude is like is like set for life. And if he actually needed money off Star Wars, he could have made more Star Wars movies. Yeah, I, I never understood his decision to sell in the first place. Uh, All right, let me. I know, I know that that uh, he was. Uh, I've read things that said that he was really um, hurt by a lot of the response to the prequel trilogy. But but even even with that, I'm still very surprised that that he sold to Disney. Sold well, this is how this is how Bob Iger put it in his in his book. Bob Iger came to him and said, "Look, you have heirs to your property, but you don't have children or heirs that are going to take it over and run it." That's the that, angle Bob uh, I used to get him to sell it. Say, said, "Look, we're good custodians. We'll be able to <laughs> okay." Uh, that's that, that's 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 very uh, similar to what happened with Fox with the Fox acquisition as well. Oh, really? Yes, because one of the main reasons why Fox sold was because um, the owner of Fox. I, uh, I can't remember his name. Oh god! Oh yeah, Murdoch didn't trust his sons to carry on the name, so he sold it before they had a chance to ruin his creation. Wow! Yeah. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. He did because yeah, I think he has two sons, and he didn't trust either one of them to carry on the legacy that he had built. So mm-hmm. he thought that it would be better to sell it off now and to to get as much money as he could from um, from from the right. deal. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's 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 really savvy. You got you got to give Bob Iger like a lot of a lot of credit because when he first came to George Lucas to sell Star Wars, George Lucas wasn't thinking about selling it. Yeah. And he like he he really finessed him and really like was really smart about everything he said about everything he did. And it took him like nine months to get him to the point where he went to sell. And part of getting him to sell it was also buying those scripts. Yeah, I I do think that like I like I said in in my run up to it, I, I I do think that maybe he was led to believe that that more than then Alan Horn is comfortable with admitting maybe he did massage it a little bit more that, that they would follow his, his line of thinking. I, yeah. I even think that that's one of the reasons why he was not at the meeting where they broke the news to him because that's part of the, that's in the book as well. He does talk about the fact that he was not at the meeting uh, where he was with Kathleen Kennedy, JJ Abrams and Michael Arndt. Uh, those three went, but Orn was not there, and it would make a lot of sense to me that he avoided going because maybe he knew that he he didn't carry on with the promises that he had made. Yeah, I mean, you just gotta like when you think about you know the way business works at that top level, yeah. and how you know you have to use both EQ and IQ to get what you want. Like Iger played it perfectly, like. Iger is like a master. The stuff he's done for Disney is going to set Disney up for the next, to dominate for the next two centuries. <laughs> like he's, I mean, I, I, like we're, we're seeing how things are going now. They're like an unstoppable force. Yeah. And it's all, it's all because of him. he came in and he was one that spearheaded the, the Marvel acquisition as well, paper. or was that him as well? Was that Iger as well? What the Marvel acquisition was that? Iger oh yeah, it was as well. Iger as well. Yeah, 
Iger, Iger as well. And Pixar as nah, well, nah. Iger. Yeah. As well as uh, their streaming service. That's, that's him as well, as well as Fox. So honestly, apart from Walt Disney himself, I don't think it's ever been a more prolific CEO of Disney. I mean, clearly. <laughs> I mean, Disney has always been a force on the market, but uh, what What's they've not? been able to do in this, this last decade has been, I mean, um, when, when, when they, they even, even, they even purchased uh, ESPN, right, as well. They, yeah. they, I think ABC, like, yeah. they, they, like, there's a lot more stuff that they own than, than we're, than we're yeah. actually talking about. But just in Hollywood, in the, in the movie, you know, making uh, part there. Yeah. Yeah. They're forced, I think yeah, definitely. Keeping the line with Star Wars news, let out. It's no longer a rumor. It's actual news that Kevin Feige is going to be partnering with Kathleen Kennedy to make a Star Wars movie. This is like really big news. A lot of people <laughs> have, have feel some type of way about it. So, Manu, what way do you feel about this news? Uh, so honest, we're exiles for <laughs> Kevin Feige, huh? Uh, well, uh, as will not, as will come to no surprise, I'm not a big fan of the work that Kevin High Feige has done with the MCU. Uh, I know that a lot of people see it as this big, beautiful, uh, connected universe that you know everything is cohesive. But uh, I don't know. For me, when I look at the MCU too deeply, I can easily see all of the plot holes and all the things that do not work or string together very well um, to hear that he's going to, to, um, to take part in star Wars, to be fully honest, it doesn't excite me, but also it makes perfect sense. I mean, he's so successful doing what he's doing. There's no, I, like I might not enjoy those movies, but um, there's no denying the rampant success that they have. Um, so I guess like from a business perspective, it makes absolute sense to bring him on to Star Wars that, you know, uh, is struggling to deal with its fandom. It is struggling to to find a way to please both um, the die hardcore fans that have been there since uh, the original trilogy and uh, to bring up a new um, to bring up a new um a new generation of France to carry the franchise forward. That that's really been what's been uh, what's been keeping Star Wars from reaching its full potential. It's that disconnect between the old and new and the new. And that's something that Fahi hasn't really been met with uh, as far as with the Marvel universe. Yeah. Uh, he's been very capable of keeping comic book fans interested and invested in in the MCU, regardless of the the, the changes. Uh, I think that that what Fahi is really good at is is selling. He's like I think that he's really good at selling these ideas to mm-hmm. to to both generations of fans. And I think that that's exactly what Star Wars needs now more than anything. You know, mm-hmm. uh, I think that you know uh, you and I uh, view the Last Jedi much more positively than a lot of people do. Uh, I think you like yeah. it a fair bit yeah, more than it. I do. Uh, I do enjoy The Last Jedi. There are things that I'm not, I don't love, but I do like it. I, I just don't think that those Star Wars movies are as bad as uh, many of the hardcore fans feel it is. But I do think that it's because they have been felt as though they've been very disrespected. They feel as though they've been left out. They feel as though something that they cared about has been in one way or another taken away from them. And mm-hmm. again, I think that Fahey with Marvel has been able to keep the diehard comic book fans, regardless of all of the liberties that he takes with the subject material and the characters, but he's still able to sell them on these new characters and and the way that they um, they connect with each other and the way that they live in their world and i do believe that if he's capable of bringing that to star wars that that could be a huge boon for disney but i but i don't see what he can bring cinematically to to that universe because uh i think that the star wars movie that have been made by kathleen kennedy and her team have been leaps and bounds better than his efforts with the mcu that i find those movies very lackluster from a filmmaking perspective Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Like, like, I, like, I agree with you. And I can expand on that in terms of one. I'm with you 
on Feige, like I know a lot of people like worship at Kevin Feige's feet. I find him to be a very mediocre creative, but I find him to be a prolific salesman and businessman and administrator. So um, that's how I see him. And to me, I'm a consumer of art. So I don't really care if your film makes $10 billion or if you make 10 million films that, you know, that make a billion dollars each. It has no impact on me. What I care is about is the creative side. And a lot of his films are just like generic, formulaic to me. But where he excels, as you said, is in selling. And Star Wars has a PR problem at the moment. And so it's interesting that a lot of the fans don't like Kathleen Kennedy. They've, you know, labeled her as the enemy. She's the avatar of Disney and and the enemy. And so it's going to be interesting to see how the fans are going to react to Kevin Feige working with Kathleen Kennedy. Is his, you know, fan goodwill going to be able to rub off on her? And will they, you know, be more forgiven and more open to, you know, ideas because Kevin Feige is involved. I think it's going to put a lot of fans in a very difficult position because I've noticed that a lot of fans of Star Wars tend to be fans of the MCU as well. So this is going to put them in a, between a rock and a hard place, and they're going to have to choose between their admiration and love for, you know, Feige that comes from their love for the Marvel products and this um, antagonism and betrayal that they feel towards uh, towards Star Wars. Do you so, think that do you think that their feelings of betrayal are are warranted? Do you think that do you understand where where they're coming from? To a degree, I do, and to a degree, I do not. Um, I think it, it depends on your vantage point, your perspective, and how personally you take things. One, I cannot claim to be a diehard Star Wars fan, so it'll be it's it's a little bit disingenuous of me to say how a diehard fan should feel. But I can try to put myself in a position of something I've been a diehard fan about and and think, how would I feel if this was done? So, for example, I'm a diehard fan of something like He-Man, James Bond, DC. So let's say He-Man. Now, uh, Kevin Smith is making a new He-Man. And in the new He-Man, it seems like He-Man is not going to be the lead character. It's going to be Masters of the Universe, but He-Man is not the lead character. And so... I'm a bit skeptical about it. Maybe like it's a, it seems like it's a similar situation to Star Wars. So I understand not being um, thrilled with the new direction and the things that they've done, but I'm not sure if I can condone being very aggressive and being, you know, sort of very vigilant about it and, you know, actively trashing the films and wanting to boycott them and you know trashing them regardless of their quality really nitpicking looking for the worst in them i'm not sure i can i can co-sign that nope. but <laughs> i under, i under, i do understand where they're coming from as much as i love the last jedi when i think of a lot of the things that the creatives did ran johnson and and kathleen kennedy did um, to the fandom before the film came out, so creative decisions, and then after their tone and the the desecration of the whole fandom and the the, the verbal abuse and the oh yeah it's, yeah it's, they, it's, they, it's, they they were they 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 give them they give it right back to them they 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 give it right like all of the ire that they were receiving from their fans they 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 gave it right back. It, it's, was, it's, it, it got it got very ugly at times. It, it got, got very it got ugly, ugly at times. It got ugly, and it's good. It's for me. I'm not a huge Star Wars fan, so I don't really care how 
it, how things go. I do know this. It's going to be really, really interesting to see. Even with episode nine, I really want to see how things go because we know the media is going to protect the Star Wars brand. Yes. And they're going to be biased in its favor. And then you have fan fans who have uh, a grudge against the franchise. They're going to be biased against it. Then you have J.J. Abrams, who's in the middle, who's trying to synthesize both um, both sides. I feel bad for him. I do. Um, I, I do. feel like he's probably going to do a lot of fan service. Yeah, I, I would agree to that. He would have to. Yeah, like I think that it's because you you have to try to mend those fa- those fences, you know. As as much as I understand uh, Disney's and Kennedy's desire to to uh, bring up the next generation of fans, I think that you can't. I think you can't move on fully without um, that that Star Wars fandom that's been around for forty years. Yeah, yeah, and it's going to be very interesting to see what Feige does. Like people talk about Feige and glow interns, but as I said, a lot of the stuff he's done for Marvel has been very generic and formulaic and same, same, samey, same, same mm-hmm. uh, using the same formula, recycling it, tweaking it over and over again. The question is, can he bring something new to Star Wars? I don't think so. Yeah, but, the, but I mean, is the question is, does Star Wars need something new though? Because it seems like a lot of people. I mean, I think Lucas wanted this, wanted this new trilogy to be to carry forward, right? As opposed yeah. to what Kennedy and Disney wanted, which was to to keep things pretty much stuck in neutral, right? Yeah, but my 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 issue with the with the Feige news is that. They're br- they're bringing him in, and I think he's just gonna try to do the mar uh, make a Star Wars Marvel movie, but that may be what Star Wars fans like. A lot of Marvel fans like that type of thing. They may not be opposed to seeing the Star Wars Marvel type of movie. For me, that's not gonna be thrilling. The most exciting things I'm seeing them attempt are things like. The Mandalorian, which looks like it has a, a, a different tone to it than a lot of the Star Wars stuff that I've seen. It seems to have a similar tone to Rogue One, which I like. Um, and uh, if they ever have the common sense to make a Knights of the Old Republic and make it very mature, quite dark and serious, I'd be very interested in that. That's part of why I like The Last Jedi. There's a bit of darkness to The Last Jedi with the hopelessness of Luke and um, the the looming specter of the Empire and with the rebels being in shambles. And there was a darkness to it and a seriousness to it in most places. Not that there wasn't some, you know, comedy, yeah. but there's a darkness to it and a seriousness to it that I uh, quite... I, I know a lot. I know a lot of Star Wars fans don't agree, but I, I did like the direction that they took Luke in. I did like, I, because I, 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 I feel like it's, I, I feel like it's understandable to have been through all that he's gone through, to have defeated Vader and the Empire, just to see it return, to to mm-hmm. have been constantly disappointed with the the Jedi, to to have lost Han and the way that he found out that Han died. I mean, I I, I think that. Any man would be it would 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 fall to will fall prey to all of that. But again, yeah. what's the, the the thing is again, maybe this is just me. I like seeing heroes not always in their best light because it makes yeah. you appreciate them so much more when they get back to that because you understand that it's not a given to being a hero, being somebody that people can count on, can rely on, can look up to. It's hard. It's oh hard. yeah, I, I completely agree with you. It's it's hard and it's taxing and 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 I always appreciate when we're shown what that there's a cost to that. 
you know that yeah. that it's not just oh yeah i'm a hero do, 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 do. no you when you're a hero you you give up things you sacrifice of yourself for the good of others and and, and sometimes that can manifest itself in some very uh disturbing ways and we saw it with luke but again what's the best thing was not that we well, the what what i liked about the last jedi is that we saw him come back and at the end um i mean maybe not in the way that you know people would have liked but in the end he still came and helped and and mm-hmm. and and was you know that that ray of light that they needed to to escape yeah no, I agree with you. It's been a while since I've seen it. I probably need to probably need to watch it again. Yeah, same um, here. <laughs> same here. Yeah. <laughs> again, I, I, don't, I, I don't I don't understand. I do understand where a lot of the fans are coming from in terms of feeling like all their sort of because one thing about Star Wars fans is that they're apart from being very passionate, part of the Star Wars universe allure is all these fan fictions and really in your mind creating and living in this universe. And they've been waiting very many years to see all the legends of Luke Star, Luke Skywalker be portrayed on the big screen. And that was completely cut short. Like I've read a bunch of like the EU books and, and I know a lot like Luke Skywalker is basically like ended up being like the Superman of, mm. of the, of the uh, Star Wars, Star Wars universe. Universe. Mm-hmm. like he grew in power, like did like incredible like Jedi feats that had never been done before, and people were kind of like excited to see like man, like Luke Skywalker is gonna come back and he's just gonna kick tail, like you guys have no idea, and he just comes back as an apathetic grumpy guy, and he is only in one movie, he just gives up, you know, his life at the end, and that's it. It's, you know, and the reins are passed on to, you know, a female character. And then there's a black character. And then a lot of white males feel that they're being like left out. It's like forced, you know, like it's not natural, quote unquote. They're killing off everything and replacing it with all these new age kind of ideas. So I get that feeling of being alienated. um, But I don't understand being as aggressive about it. I'm not sure if I would be as aggressive about it. Not that right. might be hypocritical because <laughs> I'm a fan of, of, you know, Zack Snyder's DCE movies and a lot of that was taken away from us. And I have been very, very aggressive about it to the people that took it away. So, yeah, I, I see where they come from. I really do. As do I. I understand them. Yeah. All right, let's let's move on to the next topic. Um, enough Star Wars for the day. <laughs> let's talk about a Warner Brothers movie, no longer Disney, and a DC movie, and it's Joker. So, wow. Joker has been, you know, on a lot of our most anticipated, you know, lists, at least for me, not you. You doubted the movie for so long. From from and from the from the word it. go, from the Joker word go, lit. from the word go, I have not been on board with this Joker movie. And on the flip side, from the word go, I have been. Yes, it's been like we've had a lot of interesting <laughs> back and forth on this. <laughs> but finally, we're like a week away. Not like we are a week away from seeing Joker, and it's gone through. Um, a lot of controversy in the media. Entertainment media has not been kind to it, as they tend to do with a lot of DC movies for some reason. Not for some reason, let's just call a spade a spade. There's a there's an anti-DC bias. Um, if, if the movie, if a DC movie is not explicitly um, in line with, you know, social justice agendas, so that's, if it's not, um, if it doesn't have like a female lead, um, it's probably going to get have a rough go at it, at least a rougher go at it than other movies. That's what I've noticed, and hold I've on, yet to go wrong. The Joker yeah. proves it again. It's a movie that a lot of people haven't seen, and even before they've seen it, they've been formulating opinions on it, saying it's going to incite violence, it's going to inspire mass 
shootings and mass, you know, murderers. And um, it's gotten to the point where even the creators, Todd Phillips and Joaquin Phoenix, they've had to answer these uncomfortable, um, these uncomfortable questions. And uh, it's gotten to the point where they're visibly shaken and upset and agitated, you know, by it. So, um, Manu, what's your your read on the controversy, the notion, the growing notion that, you know, this movie is going to inspire a mass shooter and also the news that uh, the Homeland Homeland Security, uh, the Department of Homeland Security sent out a bit of a memo telling uh, some of their uh, employees to be vigilant and to, you know, be aware that there could possibly be shootings at theaters. Um, uh, this is, a. Uh, it's not, uh, something easy to talk about, you know, um, uh, I, I'll, I'll start by saying that I, I feel very bad for, you know, Todd Phillips and Phoenix and Zazie Beats, De Niro, everybody that worked on the movie because, you know, they worked on the movie. You know, they there was they had the story that they wanted to tell, and they put in work and time and effort to tell that story. And to see the the way that the movie has been talked about, it must not feel feel very uh, very good, I guess. And like you just said, they're obviously shaken by it, and and with good reason. And with the the, the media attention towards this has been. I think the the attention that the movie has gotten has is more problematic than the movie itself. I think it that, I think that that you know how everybody's afraid that the movie might create uh, a situation. I think that the attention is what's going to create that situation. There's so much eyeballs on this thing now. There's so much uh, fear. I think that I'm starting to feel because even even me myself. To some degree, I, I I will not lie and say that I don't I don't feel a bit of of dread to, to next weekend, uh, and that. Um, Do you think you're going to get shot? <laughs> <laughs> not not even me personally. It's not even me. It's just anyone. I I don't want anybody to get hurt for for any reason, and and, and that's something that that uh, is on my mind because uh, all it takes is just for one person to make a decision. And and we could all be looking at this um, in a very different way. And so, I, so I, just to be clear, do you, do you think that the movie is going to inspire violence? No, I don't. I don't think the movie is going to inspire violence. I. But think, you think that the attention, that the, all the talk about, yes, I think incels and yes. mass students and yes. theater students and bringing yes. up the Aurora shooting and just all of that attention, you think is it? It's possible that it can trigger someone and it can become a self-fulfilling prophecy. Yes. Yeah. I think that that's, yeah, I think you, you hit that. Yeah, that's exactly. Yeah. Self-fulfilling pro, uh, prophecy. I think that the attention and the way that we approach this movie is more dangerous than the movie itself. Uh, well, but I, like, I, I agree with you. I agree with you. Like it's about fear and people have been, it, I'm seeing so many fear mongers because none of this comes from a logical place at all in terms of we know that there are films do not inspire violence it's been proven like researchers have like if it was proven that films inspire violence it would have been shut down like researchers have scientific researchers have done the work to show that films don't inspire violence it's just it just doesn't happen We've seen this through the decades in the in the eighties. Remember the satanic panic with like rock music mm-hmm. and d- demonic lyrics and rock music, and you know they were saying, "Oh, they need to like censor stuff." Then you get to like the nineties, and you have like rap music and NWA. We had a whole movie about NWA going through censoring and people saying that you know their lyrics, you know, are violent and they're going to make you know teens in suburbs become violent and get into this gangster lifestyle and you know that sort of thing and then 
We also saw like Mortal Kombat, the video games and first person shooters. And it's like a cycle of stupidity. It's like stupidity is a, is a, is a cyclical thing. It's like, when are we, when are we going to learn? And I think a lot of this is so hypocritical because you see movies, I mean, we, we celebrate violence all the time. Like all that's in time. our culture. Glorify. Yeah. Like Marvel movies, like no matter how shiny or colorful they try to paint them, the Avengers, they're using violence to achieve their goals. Like look, Iron Man 1. Like look at how he shoots people with like bombs and Captain America is kicking people into, you know, 20 feet into walls and, and propellers. Oh, uh, no, no, that was, and, yeah. <laughs> that was, that and, was the winter soldier. Not, that wasn't Cap. And, <laughs> yeah. The Avengers end up, you know, like killing Thanos, snapping him out of existence. Like, you know, so, I mean, and you know, cut his are, head off. Let's not forget. That yeah, head off, exactly. You know? you know, like Thor stuck a, a, a uh, an axe into his chest and you know like so it's acting pious and acting like oh you know what this joker is something different it's like what are you talking about like we had a movie about real life so we had the, the movie about ted bundy like last year cruel and uh what's yeah the complicated name <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah we had, and that's a real real life serial killer you know who who's like being portrayed by a very handsome actor you know, and we're not saying, oh, you know what, this is going to inspire somebody to a serial killer, like trigger, yeah. you know. But uh, I, I, th- I, I will add that, you know, we would be remiss if we didn't talk about the current, you know, climate in America. You know, that that has to be because a lot of this is just coming from the American media. I mean, the, the movies has been well received in Europe. I mean, it won the, yeah. you know, it's been, but it's but well, you uh, know what? Like, I agree. I agree with that. Talking about like, you know, the American, um, do you mean the American climate in terms of mass shootings? Yes. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's at the same time, you have to also remember that Joker is not the first movie. It's not. It's not. uh, That's about gun violence. It's not like, it's not the first. So, like, to me, a lot of it comes down to the American political climate in terms of discourse. And also, as I said, there is an agenda against DC movies. There just is. Like, a lot of the people who started these conversations on Twitter watching the first hints at this conversation. Let me tell you the first thing that started. It was not this thing about, about uh, incels or mass shootings. That was not the first thing. It was the script. Yeah, I remember. They'd the script was bad. This movie since, yes. They've been trying to kill it since the script. Like, I have read the script and part of the reason why I read the script was because there was this, like, grassroots movement to say that the film is, quote-unquote, a mess that the script is so bad. They were like quoting lines from it and saying, oh, this is horrible. Oh my goodness, He's, he has this affliction. Oh, it's a mess, it's terrible. Oh, Ted Phillips is a hack, blah, blah, blah. I read the script and it made me even more excited about the movie because the script is a masterwork. As Todd Phillips has said, people like Joaquin Phoenix only read a few pages of the script before he got excited about it. Zazie Pete said she read 20 pages of the script and said she must be on it. Martin Scorsese read the script and said he must be on it. Like the script is brilliant. So they'd already started to try to kill the movie since with every single chance that they could. So as soon as they got the script leak, it didn't matter that it was good. Their intention was to kill it. It's a DC movie. It's not like a happy go lucky female led uh, movie that suits their personal agendas. So they must kill it. I, like I, I'm, I'm sorry to say, like this is just, it's just the truth. A lot of this is like irrational hate, and is rolled up in the hate for DC films and DC films in particular that do not suit their political agenda. So after that thing happened with the script, people even reported on it. Like you can go and look at 
a lot of like some news outlets covered it that oh, you know, there's rumor that the Joker script is a mess. Then the film went to the Venice Film Festival and blew up. So they could no longer say that the script was a mess because the Venice it it won like the best movie at the Venice Film Festival. So they pivoted to saying that it's going to inspire mass shootings and that it's so I've I've seen it and the fear of the mass shooting thing it's just it's just been you know increasing and growing and growing and growing more and more and more uh, up till the point that we are now. I personally don't think anything is going to happen. I personally think that a lot of this is irrational. Um, I personally think that it's people who want to take down the movie for the reasons I've said. And it's something I've noticed and something that's been going on for years. Any DC movie that is not happy-go-lucky or fit with their political agenda, they try to kill it regardless of the quality. Same thing happened to Batman v Superman. They tried to kill Batman v, v, v Superman even before they saw it. There were so many rumors of how oh, the script is a mess. They're changing, and all the, all of those were lies. Oh, they said that they were changing the script every day. They oh, said my they, favorite one was how Affleck was rewriting the script in the Batman the costume. That was my favorite one because it was such a great visual. <laughs> yeah, it, it, they they concocted this beautiful story like. They didn't even say that he was rewriting it every day. He was in, in Cape oh, and Cow. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They've been doing this, like they did the same thing for, for Suicide Squad, although Suicide Squad did end up having a lot of production problems and, you know, uh, fractured, you know, fractured uh, structure. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, they, they, they do this constantly. Same thing happened with, with Justice League and it ended up manifesting being that it took off Zack Snyder, blah, blah, blah. But um, this is not something that's new to DC fans. And I, I hope that the general public and people are, are able to see this more and more and their eyes start to open to the sort of biases that all these media personalities and media outlets that are supposed to be non-biased. I hope that they start to see the biases that they have. Just because you're a fan of the MCU and you prefer the MCU, doesn't mean that you should be blind to the biases that are working against other franchises. Because at the end of the day, the most important thing is the truth, you know, and we're just we're just not getting it. Which I, is which is I, which I, is what's hurting I, the most. I, I agree with a lot of of what you said. Um, the bias has been clear for a while, and I think it goes way beyond just DC. I think a lot of the other studios are also suffering from it as well. Um, I think I, you, you posted something the other day on Twitter that I thought was uh, it was about Men in Black International uh, mm-hmm. when you said that it's not as bad as a lot of the movies that we've seen from Disney, but that it's being held to a much different standard because Disney didn't make it. And I think that there are other movies that fall under the same vein. And and um, mm-hmm. and uh, as someone who's been a fan of DC and of their of of them trying to get their cinematic universe off the ground. It, it's been very difficult to not see them be afforded the same level of of leeway that that the MCU has. Like everything that they've done has always been questioned from day one. Like you know, this is not how the other company did it. Why are they doing it this way? Everything that they're doing is wrong, and so on and so forth. And and now with this movie that is com- something completely outside of the realms of everything that we've seen as far as comic book films are, are concerned, I think. Um, I, I think that their reaction is is predictable to say the least. You know that that they have to to kill it before it has a chance to grow. And and um, I, I really wish that this wasn't the way to go. I really wish that they had been much more responsible in their approach to this because I think that that what they did, what, what they're doing right now, uh, is not. I, I just don't. I, I personally find it disgusting i really do i think that it's it's i mean one 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 critic straight up told ask phoenix are you worried that people are going to kill people because of your movie i mean i mean i mean 
<laughs> I mean, how many that's, movies? How many? That's, that's the same. That's the same critic that made a, a, a video comparing Zack Snyder's um, Zack Snyder's style of directing, some of his uh, signature style, to the style that Hitler employed in propaganda i think i remember that i do it's the exact it's the exact same reporter i i think i remember that and i mean these are and my question and and my question is why 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 is it just this movie like you mentioned it before there's so many movies that are filled with violence (laughs) Why, why, why this one? What is it about this particular movie? And I'll add that a lot of people who are talking about this have not yet seen the movie. That's the craziest thing about like, it. We, 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 we've had the, 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 the fortune to have somebody who saw the movie at TIFF came on our podcast and said, okay. and said, you feel sorry for him until you don't. So mm-hmm. the movie does not mean for you to side with this character that's not Mm -hmm. what it's attempting to do that is something that we were told by somebody who has seen the movie it's the same thing that the director and the studio have said that the movie in no way advocates for you know i i I, want to bring up i want like like and we have to think that you know we, we we've just come out of I don't even know if we fully come out of it, but we're we, we we're living in a moment in in American television where the the most popular shows were being led by people that you shouldn't root for. I'm sorry, like we like the Sopranos, The Wire, Mad Men, like the uh, even Breaking Bad, which we'll talk about yeah. in a little bit. Yeah. All of these shows that were very popular had characters that did very morally horrible things, and yet. And, and yet, we we never worried about what could be, what we I I I never saw anything like this before, I, I never have. I mean, I mean, I I I think that The Wire is the greatest television show ever made. But you can't look at that show and 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 think that you know like that inspired people to go sell drugs and join yeah. gangs and move to you know Baltimore, you know. Yeah, and 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 I think that and, and I think that that's something that that I I think that it's important to talk about, like, like like what is the role of art in our lives? What is the role of a film and storytelling within our world? You know, I I think that that it can be good to look into the minds of people that we don't fully understand or fully agree with or fully even accept the decisions that they make. I, I think that it can be important to either better understand them so that we don't make the same mistakes or better understand yeah. how they got to that point. Like I'll that's, be- that, that's what art is for. It's, exactly. It's to, to able to, to, to touch lies and open our eyes to things that we don't get to what? see every day. And I think that that's very I'll- important. Todd Phillips has always said that this is a cautionary tale. <laughs> it's a cautionary tale. It's not a glorification. It's. I mean, it, it, I'll take. It's I, not mythologizing the, the the Joker as this hero and this example and this rock star cool figure. I, I'll bring, it's I'll, a cautionary tale. I think of I think, how things can go wrong, and those are the discussions that we should be having. And you know. I think at the end of the day, we we need to look at this from looking at it from a positive, you know, point of view. This movie has inspired conversation, whether you want to call it controversy or, or not. At the end of the day, strong art always inspires a deeper conversation, a deeper exploration of issues. And if the number one issue that people want to talk about is does violent art inspire violence while they have intentionally been turned a blind eye or ignored others, if this is the movie that they choose to, to, you know, die on the hill for, 
then let this be the film that we have this conversation about so that we can have the conversation no more. Because I, I am completely confident that this movie is not going to inspire anyone to engage in, in mass shootings. And I'm not even afraid, as a matter of fact, I'm not even afraid that the attention that has been brought to the issue would inspire anyone. As a matter of fact, I think that it might detract someone. That's actually like what I'm leaning to now because they feel that, they may feel that it's not, this is not the, the safest or best time right. to go I, about. I, I, I hope you're right. I, I hope you're right. Uh, I wish that I could be as confident as you, but um, I, I really do hope that you're, you're, you're right. Um, I'm, I'm again, no, again, I'm not, I'm, again, again, I'm not somebody who, who, um, I haven't championed this movie. Um, I'm not looking forward to this movie as much as, you know, you, you are, but, um, I'm looking. yeah, but, um, with all of that said, I, I, I've really hated seeing, um, this, a lot, a lot of the conversation around it, because I think that it's just detracting from, from the work that everybody has put into the project. And, and I think from, from what I've heard, from what we've been told from people who actually saw the movie, it, it's also detracting from the message that the film is trying to embody. Like you just said, he sees it as a cautionary tale. And, 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 and like I said, we've seen it plenty of times in American cinema, uh, where, where you, where we are shown characters that we're not supposed to root for. And, and yet we, we don't, it doesn't lead, I mean, look at taxi driver, which is seen as an American classic by many people. I mean, what's, what's the big difference between that character and taxi driver and, and what we're seeing here with the Joker. Uh, I mean, that's just, that's just my take on it. I, I just feel like it's, it's incredibly unfair to, to all of the people that worked on this piece of art and and to the piece of and to the work of art itself, I think that we need to be to be better when we talk about art and because art is not real, you know, like we're able to use it to talk about uncomfortable topics and to to delve into humanity and our psyche and our motivations and the reasons why some of us turn one way and others don't, and I think that it would be a shame if every time that somebody tried to do that, that we tried to censor them. I agree with you. I couldn't have said it better. Well, we've talked about that for a while. Um, we're going to have a, an actual review. Like I'm, I'm looking forward to reviewing the movie, even though we've had, you know, our, our, you know, Toronto international film festival review from Paul. I'm looking forward to personally reviewing it. I'll probably be reviewing it with, uh, Chris, and then I'm looking forward to us having like a spoiler roundtable discussion about it. That's going to be fire. So, uh, listeners, you know, mark that on your calendar. We'll we'll have that as soon as we possibly can after quite a few of us have seen it. So now let's move on to coming soon. We're going to talk about a couple of trailers uh, in this section, and uh, in the coming weeks, if we have any news of upcoming movies. We can we will talk about those, but for today we'll just talk about four trailers um, that we've watched over the past week: uh, the El Camino, Breaking Bad story, Uncut Gems, which stars Adam Sandler, also features Kevin Garnett. Uh, quite heavily, the last quite heavily, he he was a lot. He was he, there was a lot of Kevin Garnett in that trailer. Yeah, it's it's real. Yeah. It's like yeah, um, The Irishman. Yes. Just, have like their first official trailer it's really trailer number two um and then the last of us the video game which uh we're all big fans of so uh let me let me start and say a little bit about el camino el camino now the way you feel about batman is how i feel about breaking bad just leave it alone <laughs> honestly you like I'm like come on like what are y'all doing you, you haven't watched the, the spinoff uh, I, I actually I started watching it and then I stopped mm. because to me the best thing about Breaking Bad Walter White yeah I get that it's you know that, that to me that was what it was about it was like watching this guy you know get away with with everything you know and live this double life and the cops are trying to get him and his evolution or devolution you know into 
I, I would call it more. I would call it more acceptance uh, than anything. I think it, it's the, the acceptance of its true nature. I think that's, that's what, I think that's what we really it's funny see. I don't. I I don't see it like that. I I I always, to me, I always thought he struggled with it. Um, I, and I know to you. I know obviously to you. You see this, except but I always thought that he got into a. He was someone who dabbled into something he wasn't supposed to, mm-hmm. and it spiraled out of control. Yeah, but I, I think that somewhere along the line, I think that something changed in him. I think that I, I agree. I think that that was that that was what made that show what it was. It was like that spiral that he fell into, and and that at the end he was more Eisenberg than he was Walter White. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's 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 an interesting you know character study. Yeah, it here. is. Uh, I mean, that that's how I look at at Breaking Bad. It's 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 just like you. It's a, it, it's it's about Walter White. It's about him becoming bad, Breaking Bad. You know, it's so when you know, I mean, it it, it it's nice to see these other characters around him and how they relate to him. You know, especially Pinkman. Uh, I think mm-hmm. that they have a, a great relationship. You know, uh, but you know, um, I I don't know if I'm as interested in Pinkman without White. Yeah. Even though, even though I I do like Aaron Paul, I think Aaron Paul is great. I I do like him a lot. I don't I don't I don't get why I don't I'm just like why like just it ended so so nicely. I mean, obviously it's not going to do anything to tarnish the legacy of, of the series itself. Um, it is what it is in terms of how it looks. It doesn't look ex- especially cinematic or interesting to me, or like has like cool, awesome action or a cool story. I don't even really know too much what it's about. It's Oof. just, I guess, I guess we'll see. Uh, One I, thing that's good about Netflix is that they're able to take this sort of risk, risks, which I can't, I cannot ever see anything bad about risk taken. Because it is, it is a risk. Yes, it has an inbuilt fan base, and there is some uh, name brand recognition. But you know, investing money in a mid-budget, non-blockbuster uh, movie is never an easy gamble. Not something that studios would have done. So, hopefully, they get what they need out of it. So, let's move on to the next one. Uh, let's talk about uncut jams. So in this one, uh, Adam Sandler plays a uh, Jewish gambling uh, addict. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I I hope it is. Because <laughs> I'm not gonna lie, I, I like the because, trailer. I just have no idea what this movie's about. I really don't. <laughs> I better not get canceled over this. <laughs> um, but but at least that's 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 the read that I got. Um, so he he. He plays this jeweler. Um, seems like it's in New York. Um, it features Kevin Garnett as well. So what did you think of the trailer for Uncut Gems? The trailer is great. It's a, it's a really great trailer. Uh, it's, I'm really happy to see uh, to see Sandler again in this type of role. Um, I, I've, I've always liked Sandler. I think he gets a very bad rep, especially in the last decade or so. But uh, he, he's one of those actors that I always enjoy seeing. I think that he's... He's an interesting guy, and and to kind of see him in this kind of role is is really exciting for me, and I'm really looking forward to the movie. I think I, I have no idea what role Kevin Garnett is going to play in this, but I'm I'm really interested to see how this whole story plays out. Even though I have no idea what this movie is about, it seems like he's a jeweler that's down on his luck. Maybe, maybe not. That has some gambling debts. That has that owes money, and that he's scrambling. I I'm. That, that that's the things that I'm putting together from from what I saw in yeah. the trailer. That's that's what it also seems like to me. Um, it kind of has a Scorsese feel to it. Um, like if you mixed a bit of Scorsese with a bit of not Tarantino, mm. the uh, I'd say I'd I'd rest firmly in Scorsese because Scorsese tends to have you know stories about these guys that get in over their head with you know sort of like crime and get intoxicated with with vice and you know and spirals out of control and good fellas 
Wolf of Wall Street. Yeah, that's what you're saying. It has that feel to it, and it's it's a uh, it's a more serious, you know, dramatic role for him, which is interesting. I can't say it's the most interesting. I can say I have high anticipation for it. I'll wait and see what you know people like you think about it, or if I see another trailer and it gets me more excited, then you know I'll be excited about it. But at the moment, I'm not really excited about it. I do like Adam Sandler, but interestingly, I, I actually prefer his comedies, which is just really interesting. It is interesting. I mean, I mean, I think Big Daddy is an American classic. <laughs> I think that uh, Happy Gilmore is probably one of the most um, touching films in uh, in, yeah. in our generation, man. Like, I'm sorry, like, like the dude is the dude. He's a he's a, it's a comedy legend, and even his recent um, comedy on Netflix, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it wasn't the greatest thing ever. I, I think I think I think what he, Jennifer Aniston. Yeah, uh, Murder Mystery. <laughs> Yeah, yeah I, think, I think what happened is uh, he wanted to make movies that his kids could watch, and I think that um, that turned off a lot of people that liked his more cruel, yeah. crude, more uh, Out there. Yeah, yeah humor. Yeah, I think I think that that's that's kind of what happened. Uh, he he really wanted to make films that his children could enjoy seeing him in, so he he took on like these like weird personas that were more whimsical. I guess is the right word. This like you know boy who won't grow up thing that he was always very good at. And he kind of like took it to like a whole other level, uh, but took uh, it a bit too far. <laughs> All right, I agree. I agree um, with that. But yeah, but so, um, so I'm, I'm I'm interested in seeing what he does with uh with this one. With uncut gems. All right, cool. So next up, let's talk about the Irish man. Yo, that's such a fucking great trailer. Like yo, <laughs> yo, that trailer is so good. Yo, I I love. I it's 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 funny. Uh, but but like it it has like you know that this is gonna be a dramatic piece, and that's what I love about Scorsese is the way that he can be so dramatic yet so comedic all at once. I think yeah. that that's what that's why Wolf of Wall Street is one of my favorite movies of all time. Like I I laugh so hard whenever I watch Wolf of Wall Street every single time at the same gags because it's everything just so naturally comedic because these people are just batshit crazy and like. Yeah. Again, I think, and the 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 de aging looks amazing. Like, Absolutely. if if you didn't know that that Robert De Niro was old, you wouldn't know that Robert De Niro <laughs> is old. Like, I, I I'm I'm very impressed with this trailer that I just saw, and and it looks like it's going to be a story that spans that spans a, a I long think that's, period of time. That's the most enticing thing about it. And and, and I me. love those stories. I love stories like that that we get to to like see like like so many different eras. Uh, and this man going through it as part of this organization. I'm looking really, I'm really looking forward to this. I really hope that I get to see it in like, the theater. Do you know the true life story of Jimmy Hoffa and the Buffalina uh, crime I, I family? Know, I know, I know bits and pieces. I know bits and pieces here and there. Frank Sheeran. Yeah. Like I, I actually knew it like quite well. It's one of those um, notorious gangster. Life gangster stranger story. than fiction type stories, right? Yeah. So, yeah. You're, yeah. you're, you are really, you're really going to love it. Like part of, the whole legend is it's probably like the most plausible um, explanation for the Kennedy assassination. Mm. Yeah. Like, like it's, it's like, I'm seeing the characters and Scorsese is going to do such an amazing job. So and I can't even, you, you don't think the comedian did it. <laughs> that's, I mean, come on. That's, that's a fact. That's a fact that, you know. <laughs> um, but the look of the film, just like the technical mastery, like Scorsese, such a master. I always, I'm always a bit critical about the look of Netflix movies. They have this sort of sheen to them and this sort of like overly fake digital glossiness to them. But this one has that real gritty film texture, the shadowy darks the reds are like vibrant like the color space is so beautiful like just looking at it you can tell like i this scorsese motherfucker is the real deal like this dude is a master and honestly just seeing the trailer it just warms my heart because 
we don't see people don't realize like how epic this is like this is a once in a generation type of you know creation we're talking about martin scorsese who's arguably the greatest filmmaker ever he's, he's on the on the mount rushmore then we're talking about al pacino we're talking about robert de niro and then they had to go and get um uh pesci as well i mean it's, is it's that, just is, is that harvey Keitel i saw in the trailer as well yeah harvey Keitel oh. is, is is in there as well and uh ray romano and like it's it's so freaking epic and then with you know being able to use the the aging technology which uh scorsese calls a unification i don't know why but <laughs> yeah he's scorsese you know, he can call it whatever the hell he wants okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll go along with it using that to be able to tell the tale with the same actors from when they were like you know younger to when they're like old men is just it's freaking amazing like i can't wait and then it's what it's three and a half hours long yeah, uh, oh, 210 I'm minutes. 200, uh, actually, no, now it's 209 minutes, I think. So we're going to have to uh, release this that's, Scorsese that's, cut and get that minute back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So that's perfect for me. Especially like, you know, when you have your Netflix in your home, so you can pause it, you can take your breaks, you can do like this is, this is what Netflix was made for. I agree. I, I absolutely this agree. This is what Netflix was made for. And I really hope that this movie has like a lot of success. I hope it has Oscar, Oscar success as well. I really, I really do hope so. I'm going to pay attention to it. So I think the first place it's going to be shown is at the New York Film Festival. Um, I'm going to pay attention to that. I hope that, you know, this film along with Joker, you know, get awards buzz because these are the type of films that studios aren't making, you know, mm -hmm. that studios see as too risky, you know, and we need all kinds of art to be told. And so in times where a particular type of creativity is endangered, that's when it's in the most need of being championed. So like with, with uh, the Irishman, just from the trailers, I mean, I can see it being nominated for all kinds of awards. Best director, best actor, cinematography, um, I'm not sure about score, but you know, screenplay, yeah, editing, VFX as well. So yeah, it's gonna be it's gonna be cool. Um, sorry I'm, to I'm, gush. No, it's just, uh, yeah, it's all good, man. It's a Scorsese flick. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So uh, last of all, let's talk about the, the Last of Us. And the Last of Us, it's a video game. For those but of it's you who don't so know, but you should know. So <laughs> driven that it's something that we're comfortable talking about on a podcast that's about telling stories. So what did you think of The Last of Us trailer? I thought it was an excellent, excellent trailer. Um, it, 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 um, it touches back on what made the first one so special. Um, I think that it's great to, to see Ellie again and just to be driven back to that world. Um, I think that the, the ending of The Last of Us um, I think that a lot of people thought that it was a perfect ending and it didn't need a sequel. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm glad that it's getting one and I'm glad that they took their time to make it. My only, only gripe is I kind of wish that they would have held back on that reveal at the end of it. Uh, mm -hmm. but uh, aside from that, like, it looks gorgeous. It looks very, like, like you said, it looks very cinematic. It looks like the, they've kept that same approach to storytelling that they've always had. And and I can't wait for this game. I I really really can't. Yeah, like uh, same energy over here. Same <laughs> energy. Um, it's it it looks amazing. It reminds me of when we saw the uh, God of War teaser, mm. and how that just like gave everyone like chills. It's basically the same thing. Like you know when I saw um what's his name the older guy. I'm forgetting his name. Joel. Joel. Yes. When I saw Joel, I was like, and you see like what the years have done to his, his. I mean, how much, how, how, like, how do you think he 
like I'm I'm really interested to see how like like that's that's the thing that I'm looking the most forward to. It's the how does he feel after that decision that he made at the end of the first one? At the end of the you know, like cause he Yeah, does she know the decision he made? Because they left it very amb- ambiguous. So we, we don't know if she knows or not. And and and, and would she even want to know? Do we want her to know? Like how how do you react to, to knowing that and what 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 has obviously from what we can see from the trailers, they're not like living together. They're not. They hadn't seen each other in a long time. Are they film. estranged? Is like what well, like what's like and that's what happens when you build a world so immaculately and so well. It lives on, even aside from the video game and the images and the it lives. It lives as as time goes on, like those characters, they live in our minds. They live somewhere, you know, mm-hmm. in the ether and and they age and they go through, you know, journeys of life and, and twists and turns. And, you know, we're just basically going back, you know, to see see what happens. Like if there is one video game that needs to be made into a feature it will be the last of us. The only sad thing about it is that what are you going to like? What are you going to do? Exactly. I, and I, and I, I feel the same way about the, the Uncharted series as well. I don't I don't think that the Uncharted series needs to be made into movies. I really don't. You can know. I, I, I do think that they should be made into movies because one, it's going to bring in a new audience. And when you use like different actors, it's just it's a it's a different medium. So I can see how. It should be. It's not the same thing as remaking Ben Hur. Mm, you know, okay. Pretty perfect. That's that would be my argument. So it's you don't want them to remake Ben Hur? They already tried with it because you can you can watch Ben Hur today and it's still perfect. The acting is still spellbinding. The story is still epic. Like there there was no need to remake it, and they remade it, and people were just like, eh, not gonna pay attention to it. It came and went. You know, um, but the Last of Us trailer, uh, it's it's also it's interesting. I've noticed something that we're we're gonna have a podcast actually about video games and uh, storytelling in video games, the most cinematic video games, and we're gonna have a, a spotlight podcast about that. And one thing I've noticed about the best ones these days, it seems like they've tapped into the buddy system. A lot of the best ones have companion. Yeah. So God of War, The Last of Us, even Halo has Cortana, who he, who the Master Chief always talks to. Um, uh, even Uncharted, a lot of times in Uncharted, you never, you're always with somebody. Always with somebody. Whether yeah. it's Sully or Elena, or there's always he's. Yeah. Oftentimes he's always with a partner. Yep. Yep. And it's it's a very uh, it's a good storytelling device. Is you can have like narration and you can talk and you can tell by having someone that you know the protagonist can converse um so yeah i mean the trailer and it just it looks fantastic as usual every it just uh uh like i can't touch about it you know all day the mechanics look good the you know vfx look good but best of all it's bringing us back to what we fell in love with the characters, powerful relationships, really good, uh, cinematic storytelling and a good, good music to drive emotions home, that sort of thing. So looking forward to that coming out, uh, early next year. Same yeah, energy, yeah. same energy over here. Sure. <laughs> so, uh, there we have, uh, coming soon. Um, and that wraps up, this about this is the second episode of uh, the podcast. We're going to have to come up with a name for it. We're, we're throwing a couple names around. Uh, hey, if maybe, you're listening, yeah, maybe we should have the the listeners uh, give us uh, some suggestions. Naming it E N N, so Exile News, News Network. Um, kind of like a riff on C N N. Also, we're thinking about X N N since you know X for Exiles. You know that's our thing. Um, so yeah, if you have any suggestions or if you like any of those, just you know, 
send us a message on Twitter. You can find me on Twitter at Live Love Lupe. Manu, where can people find you? You can find me on Twitter at Man United 0710. There you go. And till the next episode of the podcast, stay exiled, people.